Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 24, Upper Paleolithic of Europe, Revolution and Equilibrium. Europe before the Holocene was part of a lost world. After the planet warmed around 11,700 years ago, many features of human society disappeared forever. Cultures like the Aurignacian, Gravedian, Salutrian, Epigravedian, and Magdalenian evolved during an ice age in an environment that has no parallel today. People living on the mammoth steppe of Europe were part of a world that vanished long ago. Over the past 13 episodes, we've traced the evolution of this world from 48,000 to 11,000 years ago. We've witnessed moments of revolutionary change and long stretches of striking cultural continuity. Today, before moving on to the prehistory of other continents, we will look back over 37,000 years of European prehistory, examine long-term trends, compare cultures of the Upper Paleolithic to each other, and place them in a wider historical context. To start, let's review the major sequence of events that compose the Upper Paleolithic of Europe. By necessity, this will be quite simplified. 48,000 years ago, the shift from the Middle to the Upper Paleolithic began. Over the next 8,000 years, a mosaic of transitional cultures covered Europe, some created by Homo sapiens, others by Neanderthals. As they came into contact, both hominin species began following customs that had previously been uncommon. Specifically, they favored blade tools over flakes, they made tools from bone, and they created ornaments. These three customs defined the Upper Paleolithic and would remain elements of European cultures for the next 29,000 years. The next major turning point came 40,000 years ago, when Neanderthals disappeared from most of the continent, and the Aurignacian culture spread across Europe. The expansion of the Aurignacian witnessed the appearance of representational art, and the widespread production of tiny stone bladelets, and tools and weapons made from antler. Then, around 33,000 years ago, a new set of customs swept across the continent, including formal burials, Venus figurines, and the preference for backed bladelets and backed points, which we call gravettes or microgravettes. This was the beginning of the Gravettian culture, during which hunter-gatherers built upon the developments of the org nation and their success is reflected in the growth of the human population, artistic production, and technological complexity. In the second half of the Gravedian, the world got colder. By 26,500 years ago, the last glacial maximum had arrived. Severe environmental deterioration disrupted European social networks, and led to the loss of some Gravedian customs the abandonment of Northern Europe, and an overall population decline. Separation of groups in the West from those in the East sent descendants of Gravedians along two distinct cultural pathways. People in France and Spain created the Salutrian culture, defined by exquisitely crafted stone points, followed by the Batagulian, characterized by the predominance of flake tools. People in Italy, the Balkans, the Carpathian Basin, and parts of the Eastern Plains developed a variety of cultures, collectively referred to as Epigravedian, because most of them maintained the use of microgravettes. People in parts of Southern and Eastern Europe would continue to use these straight-backed points until the end of the Upper Paleolithic. However, through that long period, the Epigravedian would undergo dramatic changes in other types of stone tools, weapons, and art, especially after the end of the last glacial maximum. Meanwhile, in the West, as the last glacial maximum ended, Magdalenian culture emerged. Magdalenians recolonized a large part of Northern Europe, 
were prolific and skilled workers of antler and bone and produced some of the most spectacular cave paintings in European history. Another major cultural shift took place around 14,000 years ago, when a reorganization of human life led to the spread across the continent of curved-backed points, flake tools, and bows and arrows. Known as azillianization, this transition resulted in an apparent simplification of technology and art, and the adoption of a more flexible way of life. Azillianization coincided with dramatic warming, known as the Bowling Alarod, and a major migration of people from southeastern to northwestern Europe. The indigenous Magdalenians were largely replaced by people who established several new local cultures. Azillianization can be seen as the beginning of the end of the Upper Paleolithic. The final cultural evolution came with the cold downturn that occurred in the Northern Hemisphere 12,850 years ago, known as the Younger Dryas. This environmental change did not impact people near the Mediterranean as much as those in Northern Europe, who returned to making blades and hunting reindeer. Their cultures are defined by the use of tanged points and flat blades. In Europe, the end of the Upper Paleolithic and the start of the Mesolithic occurred around 11,000 years ago, a few centuries after the beginning of the Warm Holocene. This marked the end of European cultures shaped by the Cold Mammoth Steppe. Unique societies that had existed for more than 1,000 human generations, far longer than all subsequent cultures combined. I subtitled this episode Revolution and Equilibrium because I think these terms describe the cultural trajectory of the Upper Paleolithic. Revolution refers to the start of this period, when new systems of human behavior and social organization arose and became permanent elements of European culture. This revolution was followed by a period of equilibrium. For the next 27,000 years, cultural changes occurred, but these were less fundamental and followed a cyclical pattern. The Upper Paleolithic Revolution can be boiled down to three types of artifacts, stone blades, bone tools, and objects with symbolic meanings. They represent an increase in the efficiency and specialization of tools, as well as a greater importance of social interactions between small bands. The production of these items had been rare since the beginning of human history, but around 45,000 years ago, they became common elements of cultures in the Levant, Europe, and North Asia. With the arrival of Homo sapiens in Europe, blades, bone tools, and ornaments became common, including among people of the initial Upper Paleolithic in Bulgaria, the Ulusian in Italy, and the Chateau Peronian in France and northern Spain. These cultures are called transitional because although they introduced new customs, their development of blade and bone technology and their creation of art was limited. Bone tools were mostly restricted to awls, and symbolic items to beads made from shells, animal teeth, and ivory. Also, people produced blades using levallois prepared cores an inefficient method that would soon be replaced by other napping sequences. The full extent of the Upper Paleolithic Revolution took hold with the spread of the Aurignacian culture, after 40,000 years ago. The people of this culture fulfilled the potential of the new technology and symbolism. They developed a highly specialized toolkit, making blades, bladelets, end scrapers, and chisels from stone and smoothers, awls, and points from bone. They also were the first in Europe to exploit antler and ivory as raw materials for spear points and tools. In addition, representational art made its first appearance in Europe among Aurignacian tribes in the form of ivory figurines and rock engravings and paintings. 
Other changes to the lifestyle of European foragers included more long-distance transport of materials, greater structure and organization of camps, and more frequent hunting of small animals. By about 38,000 years ago, the Upper Paleolithic Revolution was essentially complete. The preceding 7,000 years had witnessed a fundamental change in social organization. The explosion of innovation and artistic production reflects the emergence of stronger connections between neighboring groups, and perhaps stronger social norms. Remarkably, this revolution took place among groups of hunter-gatherers who lived at low population densities. And yet, it marked a permanent increase in the complexity of European society. After 38,000 years ago, European cultural history entered a period of equilibrium, during which societal change was neither as dramatic nor permanent. This stability is demonstrated in specific traditions that began during the Aurignacian and continued for tens of thousands of years. For example, people used antler, bone, and ivory to make spear points, until the end of the Gravedian, when Salutrian stone points temporarily replaced them. In addition, bladelets, which were extremely uncommon before 42,000 years ago, remained a component of forager toolkits throughout every culture of the Upper Paleolithic, even when larger blades fell out of use. Even specific styles of stone points experienced remarkably long lifespans, such as the straight-backed microgravettes, which remained in use for 20,000 years. When it comes to art, Europe saw continuity in both themes and styles. People consistently depicted large herbivores in French caves from 40,000 to 14,000 years ago, especially horse, bison, aurochs, deer, ibex, and mammoth. The endurance of this tradition bears an intriguing parallel to genetic stability in Western Europe, suggesting direct human descendants throughout this period, and an absence of a major influx of outsiders. Despite the persistence of several technological and symbolic customs throughout this period of equilibrium, important cultural changes did affect Europe, even including further increases in social complexity. Upper Paleolithic societies were influenced by climate, population size, and human migrations. But after 38,000 years ago, these environmental and demographic factors often led to reversals of previous cultural shifts, creating cyclical trends. Furthermore, the adoption of some new customs reflected shifting beliefs, rituals, and styles, but not permanent turning points in prehistoric life. For example, changes in hunting weaponry, such as the shape of stone or organic points, probably reflects subtle functional improvements or stylistic modifications, but these were often abandoned after a few centuries or millennia of use. Also, the evolution of artistic themes, from the prominence of lions in Aurignacian art, to women in Gravedian imagery, to purely geometric drawings on a zillion pebbles, reveals shifting rituals, beliefs, and mythologies. But the degree to which these relate to fundamental social change is unclear. Another way of describing this equilibrium is to say that from the Aurignacian to the Younger Dryas, technological and social complexity in Europe went through cycles. Periods of growing sophistication and diversity in tools and rituals were followed by phases of decline, when collective knowledge was lost. This cycle repeated more than once, and can be seen clearly in the trajectory of the Magdalenian. This period began with an increase in the elegance of antler working, stone tool production, painting, and engraving. It reached its peak with spear throwers, points, fore shafts, half round rods, harpoons, pierced batons, perforated discs, spatulas, awls, and needles made from antler and bone, and blades 
bladelets, end scrapers, chisels, and drills made from stone. Around 15,500 years ago, the Magdalenian entered its decline phase, as most types of tools and art were abandoned. Here, I must make an important disclaimer, which I've made before. Our understanding of these trends is based on tools, ornaments, and art made in stone and hard organic material, and it may be different if we had information about items made from wood or fiber. Due to this cyclical pattern, technology and social organization in Europe at the end of the Upper Paleolithic was not much more advanced than that of the Aurig nation 25,000 years earlier. There was not a permanent accumulation of knowledge that carried over into the Mesolithic. There are a handful of exceptions which remained as part of hunter-gatherer toolkits beyond the Upper Paleolithic, such as barbed harpoons, fish hooks, bows and arrows, and shaft straighteners, which were used in the final 5,000 years of the Upper Paleolithic. But most technological and social innovations made between 38,000 and 11,000 years ago were temporary. For instance, ceramic production appeared and disappeared twice during the Upper Paleolithic. The lack of permanent technological advancement suggests that after the initial revolution, European societies did not consistently increase in complexity. This reinforces an important idea. The history of humanity was not an uninterrupted series of advances. To understand this further, let's take a closer look at the differences between the cultures of the Upper Paleolithic. The artifacts that define the Upper Paleolithic, blades, bone tools, ornaments, and art, were not equally present in all cultures. This package was most clearly expressed in the Oregonation, Gravedian, Magdalenian, and certain moments of the Epigravedian, such as the Mazinian of Eastern Europe. Interestingly, those periods tend to demonstrate evidence of greater social and technological complexity, especially in certain phases which I will refer to as Golden Ages. On the other hand, over the course of the past 13 episodes, we've also learned about times when Europeans deviated from the Upper Paleolithic package. These cultural digressions are also less likely to show signs of technological and artistic sophistication, and mostly fall within two periods, the last glacial maximum and the bowling alarod. To understand this cultural variation, let's examine the highs and lows of the Upper Paleolithic. Starting with the highs, I will use the term Golden Age to describe periods with increased evidence of social complexity, such as a higher frequency of artistic and ornamental production, long-distance trade, formal burials, and specialized toolkits. These activities point toward greater social organization, including division of labor and hierarchy. Sophisticated cave paintings, carvings, and tool production reflect the existence of specialized artists and craftspeople. Lavish burials, exotic ornaments, and elaborately crafted weapons suggest growing social competition as prestigious individuals rose to leadership roles and as regional identities solidified. Based on those criteria, we can identify at least four golden ages. The first occurred from 31,000 to 29,000 years ago during the Middle Gravedian. This was a widespread phenomenon found in northern Spain, France, Italy, and further northeast among the Pavlovians in the Czech Republic. Venus figurines, elaborate burials, and cave drawings of animals following stylized norms seem to peak during this 2,000-year-long stretch. Technical competence in toolmaking increased, with antler points becoming longer, narrower, and more frequently decorated than those of the Aurig nation. Shells were traded over distances of up to 800 kilometers. Among the Pavlovians, ceramic figurines were fired in kilns, 
at settlements with mammoth bone structures. The next golden age came between 28,000 and 26,000 years ago, in the flatlands of Eastern Europe, with the emergence of the Kostenki Avdevo culture. Here, mammoth hunters carved exquisite figurines of animals and women, along with a wide array of jewelry, decorated tools, and weapons made from bone and ivory. Like Pavlovians before them, they built houses and storage pits. About 8,000 years later, another mammoth-based society flourished on the eastern steppes. From 18,500 to 17,000 years ago, Mezinians, living soon after the end of the last glacial maximum, resembled their Kostenki Avdevoen and Pavlovian predecessors in many respects, even producing female figurines. Not only were their camps rich in ornaments and antler tools, but they implemented a highly organized system of movement to collect and trade resources around their settlements, including amber and shells from more than 600 kilometers away. Just after the Mazinian, the Magdalenian culture entered its golden age between 17,500 and 15,500 years ago. Of all the Upper Paleolithic Golden Ages, this was the peak of artistic production, exemplified by exquisitely carved spear throwers and naturalistic polychromatic cave paintings. There was even a return of formal burials for highly regarded individuals, and complex trade networks through which exotic ornaments like jet, shell, and whalebone were transported, sometimes more than a thousand kilometers. In terms of symbolic creation, two other periods deserve honorable mention. Neither of these show the overall complexity of the other golden ages, but they represent local peaks in artistic and ritual activity. First is the Salutrian, when engravings and paintings on cave walls and stone plaques reached an all-time high on the Mediterranean coast of Spain, between 25,000 and 23,000 years ago. Second is the late Epigravedian of Italy, when formal burials, engravings, and paintings flourished during the Bowling Alarod and Younger Dryas. Similarities between the Golden Ages of the Upper Paleolithic allows to draw a few conclusions. First, they each lasted between 1,500 and 3,000 years, suggesting a limit to the lifespan of higher levels of social organization during the last Ice Age. Second, three of the six included mammoth-dependent cultures that adopted a semi-sedentary lifestyle, suggesting a correlation between less frequent mobility and the emergence of social complexity. Third, most golden ages took place at times and places of increased population density, if we use the number of archaeological sites as a proxy for this. For example, by the Middle Gravedian, the population of Western Europe had doubled from that of the Oreg nation. Also, the Kostenki of Devoen of Eastern Europe and the Salutrian of Southern Iberia probably originated after the arrival of climate refugees, fleeing increasingly cold winters between 28,000 and 25,000 years ago. Finally, both the Mazinian and Magdalenian Golden Ages took place soon after the end of the last glacial maximum, a time of population recovery. This evidence provides strong support for the idea that as hunter-gatherer bands came into more frequent contact with each other, interest in and capacity for technological and artistic innovation grew. Another interesting note is that two of the greatest works of cave painting, Chauvet and Lascaux, were not produced during one of these six golden ages. Chauvet was painted 36,000 years ago, during the Oreg nation, and Lascaux 21,000 years ago, during the transition from the Batagulian to Magdalenian. Facts which add to the mystery surrounding these masterpieces. We can only wonder whether Chauvet and Lascaux were short-lived explosions of artistic capacity or whether our understanding of cultural trends is incomplete. 
The golden ages of the Upper Paleolithic were mirrored by low points of social complexity and deviations from the defining characteristics introduced during the initial revolution. One of these was during the last glacial maximum, when early Epigravedians surviving in southern and eastern Europe made fewer symbolic artifacts than their predecessors, and in the Carpathian Basin switched from blade to flake tools. To the west, even though Salutrians and Batagulians maintained the rich artistic heritage of their ancestors, their toolkit underwent fundamental changes. On one hand, Salutrians shifted from antler to stone points for their hunting weapons, and their descendants, the Batagulians, transitioned from blade to flake tools. All these changes differentiate these cultures from the Aurignacian and Gravedian that preceded them and the subsequent Magdalenian. The second major period of deviation from a typical Upper Paleolithic lifestyle came with the warm bowling alarod, when Nazilianization replaced long blades with short flake tools across Europe. In addition, in much of the Magdalenian world, antler spear points were replaced by stone arrowheads. The diversity of bone tools declined dramatically, and artistic production became more simplified. Many of these changes would endure into the Younger Dryas and Holocene. In fact, azillianization can be viewed as part of the transition from the Paleolithic to the Mesolithic. Importantly, this loss of several key customs coincides with a major migration of people across Europe, which disrupted established social networks. The cultures of the last glacial maximum and bowling alarod show that the largest departures from the Upper Paleolithic traditions came during the coldest and warmest moments between 15,000 and 11,000 years ago. In other words, the periods when the environment would have been most different from the mammoth steppe that covered the continent during the Aurignacian, Gravedian, and Magdalenian. In addition, both periods of departure witnessed major population disruptions, whether through death and isolation, or through migration and displacement. There was never a complete loss of the Upper Paleolithic package of blades, bone tools, and ornaments, but there was a loss of the higher levels of social organization that had emerged during the Golden Ages. This brings us finally to the end of our exploration of the Upper Paleolithic of Europe, a period of revolution and equilibrium. We will now move on to explore the same time period in other parts of the world. In this upcoming journey, we will be able to examine whether the people who colonized other continents during the out of Africa migrations underwent similar patterns of cultural evolution as in Europe. Did they experience revolutions in human behavior? Did the first Asians and Australians adopt blades, bone tools, and ornaments? And to what extent did population size, migration, and climate coincide with cultural change? There's a lot left to discover. In our next episode, we will move back in time and more than 14,000 kilometers away from Europe to begin our exploration of the prehistoric cultures of Australia and New Guinea. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support will allow me to continue bringing you our prehistory. <laughs>